Okay, welcome to this to this late talk. The universe so infinitely strange and Steini will tell us about it. Steini has been here estimated forever and uh, has studied math and physics, but is not really a mathematician and physicist, but he can talk about the universe very well. So, and we are happy to have him here. Uh, sit back and uh, open your ears and a very warm welcome for Steini, please. Yeah, hello. Hello, thank you. Lots of people. I'm impressed. I thought it would only be 20 or 30. Okay. So the universe, quantum physics, and I want to take you along on a journey uh, first into the past, maybe into the past of science, the history of science, of physics, because if you, if you try, I think if you try to tell lay persons and absolute beginners talk to them about quantum physics, then uh, we need a bit, some, some foundation, and we need to know how science works. A uh, long time ago, Aristotle and physics at the time, and f science, philosophy was mostly the same. The universe contained of uh, fire, water, earth, and, and, uh, and uh, fire, water, earth, and Water, water, yeah, and and wondered about what is light, light, and we talk about quantums, then we talk about light quantums, and light is very elementary in this. The old Greek thought the light came out of the eye, so we talk about light of the eye, and so the eye is light of the world, and so people can see, and so it's infinitely fast. So if you, if you close your eyes and open them again, everything is visible again, so no time is passing, so light is infinitely fast. Okay. And quite a long time this uh, prevailed, this view prevailed, but there were critics, but they couldn't, but they couldn't, uh, well, there was no really a scientific method for a verifiable theories and things like that. And there were, and in medieval times, it wasn't a lot better. Better, the church uh, tried to prevent things that could have opened the eyes of people. So now we are around 1672. Ole Römer, Ole, a Danish astronomer, tried to. He was Galileo had a had a telescope, had built telescopes and had a big, was a dealer in telescopes, and Ole Römer tried to, to solve the problem of time. And how can you measure time precisely if you're not, not a clock, not a very, very precise clock? So, and he wasn't the first to do that. And what he did was um, look at the planets. And at a time where people knew or should have known, although some people denied it, that the Earth is a sphere and circles around the, the Sun, and there are other planets also circling there. And he looked at Jupiter, looked at Jupiter's moons, how Jupiter's moons look circled around Jupiter, and it's a very precise clock. And if you could understand exactly how that works, you had very uh, very precise clocks, and you, had, you could know where you are on Earth if you have a very precise clock. And he made a table and wrote down when these moons uh, disappeared behind Jupiter. And and in this table, many moons, for many moons, he made these tables. And depending on the season on Earth, the, those figures differ. And he thought about it and and found that it was, there was a rhythmic difference. And it was in summer, it was different from winter or spring or summer. But the next summer, it was the same as the summer before. So it has to be, has to do something with the Earth circling around the sun. And then found out that this couldn't be possible that light was infinitely fast. And he couldn't explain it differently except by a finite speed of light. And 
So if, you, if we were longer away, far, farther away from Jupiter, the light takes longer. And when we are closer ju to Jupiter, the light doesn't take as long. And, and in science, it's very important he made a prediction for a specific date at which time the moon would disappear behind Jupiter. And it was, it was a 10-minute difference from his table uh, because he knew the speed of light is infinite. And, and this, um, this prediction came true. And there was something that was very valuable in science because the theory that he had was not very bad. So he did something very well. He showed that the speed of light is finite. And there's something about light with quantums. And why do I talk about this? Because science uh, works very well if you can observe something. And from this observation, you can make a hypothesis. And if you then make a theory from that, make a mathematical description of that, and from this mathematical description can make a prediction and can uh, come up with an experiment and perform this experiment, and then my prediction comes true. And then in science, in physics, I have really done, have really achieved something. Then we jump forward a few hundred years, 1856, 59, or in the, in the 70s, Max Planck studied physics, and people said, oh, no, don't do that. His father said, don't do that. If you study physics, you can't become anything. Nothing will come of you. But he still did, and some things were still strange, and he looked at, into that, and he wasn't the first, and he found that strange, and he looked at black body radiation. And how do black bodies radiate? How do they emit light? When they get hot, they are black because they, are, they, don't, they don't reflect light, and whatever they light comes from them is their own radiation, and it's quite difficult. 1895 to make a black make a black body is very hard he made a box and made a, made a hole in it and so it's so it's black and looked at the color of the hole if he heated up this box and he looked how the color of this light um, agreed with classical physics of the time and what there were what was a, was called a measuring error was was wasn't right and the prediction was very strange because the prediction said the more energy I put into it uh, the shorter the wavelength becomes from the light and that some t at some time would need to lead to it becoming yellow and blue and ultraviolet and the box would disappear then at some time but the box doesn't disappear well this is this was called then the ultraviolet catastrophe and this mathematical theory behind this this physics people had thought of uh, wasn't right. And then he looked into it and he researched it and thought it was uh, worthwhile. But shit, it doesn't really work. And he called it the act of ultimate desperation. And he introduced a constant just out of thin air, not quite out of thin air. We don't talk about the details, otherwise we wouldn't finish today. He introduced a constant and called it H, the active quantum, and he that led to the energy not being uh, transmitted continuously, but in packets. And this uh, packet-wise transfer of energy, so not continuously increasing, but in, in, in different packets in this equation, led to, led to the equation making very good predictions and predicting something uh, that could actually be measured and uh, many years he worried about that he was angry about that because he really wanted to to save the old physics that he liked and this was just an emergency in, in desperation he invented this quantum and into the 1920s he tried to get rid of it because who, he who he found that it actually made sense uh, was Albert Einstein. And 19, 1904 or 1905, he thought, damned, Max Planck is right. And it isn't just, it's, it's really all energy is, is quantized and only comes around in, in, 
in little packets. There's no half light packet. There's not three quarters or two one seventh light packets. There are only whole light packets, one or two or four or eight or six, and they transport uh, a specific amount of energy depending on their frequency. And he could prove that by the photoelectric effect. And what many people don't know, it was for that and only for that he won the Nobel Prize and not for E equals MC squared or general relativity or anything like that, but for that, for the photoelectric effect. And now let's think at what time we were, 1905, the existence of the atom was a hypothesis. It was the ato atomic hypothesis and it wasn't quite clear. And you have to imagine the, the leap of, of faith where the universe was just a single galaxy. Everything you could see was just one galaxy. And one th people thought there was nothing outside the galaxy. And atoms, well, yeah, hmm, was just, uh, well, we can talk about that. But, and he only received the Nobel Prize in the 1920s when it became clear that he was damn right. Right, so we have Albert Einstein, and together with these thoughts of Planck, he um, discovered quantum physics and developed quantum mechanics. There were other people who added themselves to this roster. Well, uh, Einstein was sitting in a car with a young phys physicist called Weiner Hasenberg, who told him about his uncertainty relationship, when suddenly Einstein became an old classic physicist and said, well, that's that's completely random, that's that's, that's crap. That, it's obvious, everything is clear. It's not one or the other. What does it mean, uncertainty principle? Well, Heisenberg had the following thought. Well, f I can't, given a certain quantum, he developed the maths around it using ma matrix mechanics, which worked quite well, but which worked quite well, but everyone thought it was crap. Well, Einstein also didn't think it was that awesome, but, but it predicted the following. Given a quantum, I can either know exactly the position or I can know exactly what direction and with what speed it moves. And I, I'm not, this is with the prediction, not because I can't, I'm not able to measure, but there's, a, but this, there's a, it's inherently impossible. And this is where it gets bizarre. It's fundamentally impossible if you nail the particle down, you cannot say what energy it has and so long as I know exactly where it is. And this, the, the consequences are, there's a lot of weird stuff that happens as a consequence. And Einstein thought it was quite, quite annoying. So then came along Erwin Schrödinger and tried to save it. And who thought of the Schrödinger equation, a ni ni nice wave representation of this ba particle based physics. So we're moving towards the dilemma of the, the, the wave, what is light? Well, we know it has a speed, but is it a wave or is it a particle? Is it a quantum, just like quantum physics, the, the, the new fancy quantum physics, or is it a wave? As is might be obvious, well, Schrodinger came up with a wave equation, which worked very well, exceptionally well. It, so there's there there are now two systems that work very well: the matrix mechanics and the wave Schrodinger's equation. Max Planck th thought the wave equation a lot, a lot more elegant, but it led to some very bizarre theories. It, we have to think that this is all theoretical. So these these were, so these were all theoretical thoughts. They had very few, they had very little direct experimental research. They just tried to, um, well, to try to just to do the thought experiments. And you can only do this if you understand it and try and write it down in a mathematical form. The whole, the whole, th the science is pointless if you don't have a working mathematical model. So now we have the following phenomenon. Right, we need to find out: is it a wave? Is it a particle? So someone, someone suggested you've all you you've all heard, heard this the two slit experiment. It works as follows: I shoot some light through two slits, which are very close to each other, hoping that, so, well, okay, lights are waves, it meets this, this slit, and behind the slit, it it uh, propagates like, uh, like a wave, and because I have two slits, and because the two waves, uh, uh, that's just like imagine putting through stones in, and they interfere 
coherently or incoherently. And then I have a, have a screen so I can see an interference pattern, which is a funny, funny, funny pattern, just like if you imagine having a wave hitting a you know, hitting a wall and leaving some color traces. All right, said as they said, they did it. And all right, there we, there we go. Well, there was still the quantum physics in the room. Well, light is a particle. So you can think of the interesting, interesting experiment, which you, they couldn't actually think of at the time. All right, let's try. Which of the slits did it actually use? I'm going to use a detector, which spots quanta. It, realize it spots quanta, light quanta, or electromagnetic particle. You could also use an electron. And as soon as I look, it stops doing it. As soon as I look, which of the slits does the light go through? It no longer behaves as a wave. And um, that's pretty weird, isn't it? Well, how does the light know that I'm looking? That's even weirder. So, so I have to. I, we could talk about this for hours. How you determine this? You have to believe a few things. I want to fascinate you, to uh, so that you can look into it yourself. So, what you can demonstrate is that if this particle passes through this double slit, then it's not that if I don't look, it goes through one, and then and then if you use a different particle, you use the other slit, which is somehow also a wave and it interacts, but actually it uses, it passes through both one and the other at the same time. Well, you, unfortunately, you have to believe me here. We can't demonstrate this here experimentally, but, but, you can diminish the so the source of light so much that there's only so that only individual photons are emitted, and you can detect them. You just put a screen somewhere, and it it does makes emits a pling if there's a photon, and so we can see that it has been uh, emitted. All right, so I'm going to put this double sit there. So I'm going to shoot a single photon in that direction, and on the other side. It hits the wall, but not as if it had gone through a single slit, but in the same way, in the way as if it interfered with itself. And you can demonstrate it's possible. It's a complicated proof, but it is possible. It's it has in, in the final form is only proved in 1989 that th we can prove that this particle passes both through one slit and also the other at the same time that it also uh, took every single other possible path that there was. So long as I don't look. Right, and it gets worse. It's not just... So, all right, so we have to go back a bit. So the Schrodinger equation says, predicts, and this is where Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr also, so Niels Bohr is a famous person uh, based on the, the Bohr atom of the model. If you if you learn that that uh, electrons are orbiting in the core, it's complete. It's a complete nonsense. There's makes absolutely no sense. Um, I I got very annoyed by this in the school because the teacher couldn't explain. So uh, the, the core is positive. The electrons are negative. They're orbiting. There are several electrons that are orbiting. They, they're negative, so they, they repel. How could they possibly orbit uh, around the around the core in several shells? How's that? How's that? How's that possible? It's it's not possible. That's only for demonstration purposes. This is the problem with quantum physics. You can't. It's not very. Uh, you can't really look at it, and not at all. It doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't mesh with our practical sense of how the world works. So as, as promised, it's going to get more bizarre. So I can do an experiment that which is suggested by the Schrodinger equation. It, ex it predicts if you can interfere, if you can uh, interact with two, two particles together so that they behave just like a single particle. And it, the equation says, it doesn't say where the particle is. It says there's only probabilities. It only says there's a certain probability that the particle will be here or there if you look. 
That's the important point. Only if I check, if I observe. If I don't observe, it's everywhere at the same time, but with a higher probability over here. Well, given these two particles, that's a bit weird. So how they behave as a single particle, but these two particles can be in, can be measured in two places at the same time because they're two particles, but they do depend on each other. They are, in some sense, a single particle. They are condividing the, the information. So, all right, let's go back a bit. If a half semi matter mirror, um, light passes through it, about half of it. All right. All right, I shoot a photo at it, and there's a certain probability that the photon will pass through, and there's some probability they won't. And this probability is exactly 50%, because it's semi transparent obvious. Well, there's no reason for this. And this is an, imp an important, very important fact of quantum mechanics. There are, there are, there is baseless randomness. This is, which is bizarre. Well, normally you could say, and this this is what Albert Einstein said for a very long time, that God does not roll dice. There is no there's no baseless randomness. I just don't know everything. If I, if I throw throw up a coin and I get a random result, well, if I knew everything, the the air resistance, speed, etc., etc., I would be able to predict what side will be up. But given this quantum, I cannot predict. And I can prove, there is a proof that proves that I cannot know whether it's going to go through or not. It's a completely random and baseless randomness. All right, so I have two of these particles, which I generate using a photon. I shouldn't need to care how I generate it. OK, all right, so I'm going to create these two interlock particles. All right, it goes in two, two directions. So in this direction, I observe, as you can, has it gone through the mirror or not? All right, I have done it over here, using over here. If I do that, it will do the exact same thing on the other side, even though it's completely random. How does a particle over there know that the other particle has gone through? And that's one of the key questions of quantum mechanics. Nobody can answer this question to this day. It gets even more bizarre. I can and you can check this on Google, the, I can do the delayed quantum eraser experiment, which, with which I can demonstrate that this, that this property is also applicable reverse in time. It's a very complicated experiment. I'm not going to explain this. I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just doing the usual trick that people do. I mean, I explained this using um, uh, coins. All right, normally I throw up a coin and I put it on the de des desk, it's either head or tails, and do it on the other side as well. They're completely independent. All right, if I have two interlock ones, and if I throw both of them up and grab one, grab both of them, and if I look on one side, I have head, then I have head on the other side as well, guaranteed. All right, now we get to the quantum eraser, We're using with which you can uh, demonstrate it is reversible in time. All right, I'm going to throw both bo coins up in time. I'm going to put, I'm, I'm going to, Took, take the one and put it down on the ca put it down on the table. The one on the table has already decided whether it has a tail. All right, now I'm going to take this 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 quantum for a, for loop. All right, now I check the, the one that's in, in in the air. Is it is it a number or is it, is it head or tails? All right, you understood. It's they're both tails. This is what quantum interference is. This is what um, Einstein called the spooky long distance effect. These are the two things where Einstein was like, what the fuck? What do you mean complete randomness? That's crazy. That can't be. Oh, die, God doesn't roll dice. And the spooky long distance effect, uh, he wouldn't have anything to do with it because this is, it has a consequence, which is that we have to say goodbye to our u previous view of the world completely. At the core, the world is set up in the following way. I don't know where a particle is, so long as I don't look, which I, it's not just because I don't know because I don't know, because I'm not looking, because it, it's because it hasn't decided. Well, it sounds banal, but just imagine there's a radioactive particle. This radioactive particle is going through space, and now it's simultaneously at, in the state, it's already decayed, it's already a different particle. 
So no longer uranium, but whatever. Uh, no idea. I'm not. A, I'm not an atomic phys a nuclear physicist. Maybe some electron, an alpha particle. What? Well, anyway, it's both uranium atom, but at the same time something else. So long as no one's looking. So the, this particle is coming towards me. So long as I haven't looked at the particle, as I haven't observed it, I can't tell. Not just because I'm not able to, because I'm not looking there, which is obvious because I can't see, but just it, it's fundamentally impossible because it has not been decided yet. And due to this, it's, it's not obvious if the moon is there even if someone isn't looking. That's not a joke. Or the question which was posed back then, wouldn't somebody have to look at the moon all the time to make sure it's there? Now we get to the core of the matter and at the same time change the theme to cosmology, which is closely related. The core of the matter. What exactly does it mean to look at something? What is the measurement? When does a collapse of wave function happen? When does the wave function collapse? And th that's the bizarre thing. This happens with super light speed. It, in, in one instant, if you if you watch the if you the, the, the particle, and it goes the uh, mirror at the other end at the same time. This information which cannot be exchanged because we know since Einstein that it can't travel faster than light. Somehow these two particles know of each other and the, the, the superposition collapses at the time, at the instant that I look at this. And so if, I, if I've seen it here, it, it goes away over there. And if I didn't, then it does appear there. Before I did it, it was at both places at the same time. As long as nobody is looking, it can be anywhere at all. We don't know. It's not just that we don't know, it is everywhere at the same time. It only appears at one place if I look with a certain possibility, probability. And the tunnel effect, which you may have heard of, you know, if quants tunnel through an isolator, um, there's a certain probability that they arrive at the other side because the wave function sort of smears through the isolator. And that is the, uh, the basis of quantum physics. I can measure these effects. I can check this. You can check with Google. Uh, take a look at the Bell equation. I can prove that the information isn't there from the beginning like it was already clear when these photons were born. No, it's random. It is decided the moment that I look at the photons. And the heart of the matter is what does it mean to take a measurement? Is it that a measurement that takes a... a so this is a question we don't really know what the measurement is and, and how it how it influences it and we really don't know and that's what makes quantum physics so fascinating. It is absolutely not clear if it is necessary that there is awareness to to uh, lo looking at the measurement and and nobody really knows without any doubt. So there's a reason to believe that it can be done without awareness, but there is no proof, and, and this is just, they are just guesses and some equations that to uh, lead us in that direction, but we don't really know that. But uh, Erwin Schrödinger uh, said that the total amount of awareness in the universe is exactly one. And maybe he was talking about himself, so because he cannot say anything about anything else. Well, so let's get to the other part of this talk, and that is cosmology. So what does this have to do with cosmology? 
and it has to do with it that oh well we we have to we have to go back a bit go back a bit further in the 1920s 1925 around there Edwin Hubble had a huge telescope and looking into the world and found out uh, maybe it was a bit earlier and he found that whoa there are more than one galaxy and because he could see others with a good telescope and he could something else which which really destroyed the old image of the world that there was only one galaxy he could see more galaxies but he could see something more by by looking at exploding supernovae 1a type supernovae they make a very specific very specific uh, image very very bright in a very typical profile they have a this eruption of brightness it is as bright as the center of a galaxy it is bri as bright as as billions of suns and this is the type 1a supernova and one can use that to look to say um, how how bright is it really and look at how fast is it moving this is a, a redshift it is not doppler it is it's a relativistic effect but we can see look at the supernova and then see how fast the galaxy is moving away from us and he found that all of them are moving away from us and that is strange and it's really um, strange because it it shows that that earlier they were closer together and even earlier they were closer together and you can calculate back and and uh, current calculations um, have found out that that a long time ago um, I wrote it in the introduction there were it, they were at a single point it's such a bizarre thing as a point of a of a size of the quantum length it is 10 to the power of minus 34 35 it is the smallest length that we can talk about in physics really for everything smaller uh, particles would become black holes so that would be smaller at all smaller scales so we cannot really apply our physics on these small scales it doesn't really matter but but all the universe was well we just can't talk about it we can't say anything about it so physics physicists will just shrug and say we, we don't know we can't say anything physical physicists never say never say why but he says how and and, it, and works and the, that's the the philosophers then say why it works and the physicists just say well just calculate it and einstein just said it, it has to be real and uh, that's really the problem we have to go back to quantum physics and we need to um, use one of both concepts do do uh, things have one definite position in that case uh, we have to uh, accept that they don't have impulse or do they not have position then so somehow this 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 concept of of time and space is uh, strange it doesn't work this concept seems relusion. It, it 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 isn't. It's not really in these dimensions. It's not then somehow not really real. And we're going back to cosmology, and we look back to the beginning of the universe and all the universe, and we get a better understanding of this if we find that particles consist of protons, neutrons, and electrons, and protons and neutrons consist of quarks. And as far as we know, quarks have no size. Shit. So, and then there's the string theorist. Well, yeah, but but they have, but very very small. It's just a string, which doesn't really isn't really interesting uh, according to the what I call the classical quantum mechanics. After after what we know today, the not string theory, quarks do not have any size. They they're simply energy, and so whatever everything you consist of is pure energy they're standing waves and and wobbling around but really don't have any size though so they're vibrating energy but no size uh, a proton a proton has a mass and you can measure that it's it's quite complicated but you can read about it how how that is done and you find that three quarks have an energy and somehow some sort of mass and a, a resting mass and, and it's it doesn't equate to the mass of a proton the three quarks, they, they only make up 3% of the mass of the proton, and the rest of the mass comes from the energy of wobbling back and forth, and 
and the quantum fluctuations. What is quantum fluctuation? It's a very bizarre construct of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. If only it goes fast enough below the Planck time is the time that light you needs to pass a Planck length, 10 to the minus 34th. It's very, very short, but below this time, the physics doesn't work, and you can violate the physics, and you can violate the law of conservation of energy and everything that is holy in physics. And uh, below Planck time, everything can happen spontaneous. As much energy can be created, always two, always, always, always two, and a part and its anti-part. Uh, they just have to disappear fast enough, and then the physics isn't violated, then everything is zero in the sum total. So the theoretical physicist is happy, and everything hunky-dory, everything clean. Now, if this happens all the time, though, and it does happen all the time, then energy uh, comes from nothing and it goes back to nothing and this energy this virtual energy actually increases the mass or contributes to the mass of the proton and let's imagine you know that all matter that you know uh, consists of small parts of nothing really or maybe strings if you believe in string theory so now it's clear that all of matter isn't actually matter it's really, like Einstein said, E equals m squared, it's really energy. So all this is condensed in a very, very small room that you can't even imagine. It's it's like a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a meter. All this energy fits in there because it consists of like nothing. And the idea, which hasn't been proven, but the idea of the origin of the universe is that all this energy, the entire universe could could be spawned from a, a quantum fluctuation. It's, it's, it's a bit hard to imagine that that this, um, this room uh, expanded like an explosion so quickly, and this is actually it doesn't fit with relativity theory it it expanded faster than light well it's really the space between particle that that, that grew so quickly that they they uh, got distant but quicker than light that's the cosmic inflation which you may have heard of so uh, just recently somebody said uh, we found cosmic inflation um, Looking at the background radiation, uh, you can go look back in time. The universe is 13.8 billions of years old. And we can look back in time up, up until the point where it was about 300,000 years old. That was the point in time when the universe became transparent. Before that, everything was a big plasma um, and really opaque. Um, you know, whether it's 100,000 or 300,000 years, nobody knows quite for sure. But that's when it became transparent. And we now see the background radiation. These are areas of variations uh, in, in, in temperature of the background. These variations of brightness that we see is the reason for planets, stars, galaxies forming. Otherwise, everything would have been the same and homogeneous everywhere. But if today's physics is right, then the quantum fluctuation of space at the very beginning of the universe is what, what makes stars and planets today. And then and stars explode and the, the, the laws of physics are, are built so the origin of the universe may have its origins in quantum mechanics and the BSEP2 experiment has tried to prove the following they showed that this cosmic inflation which so far has only a theory that something should have happened which is um, gravitational waves, so-called gravitational waves. Let's imagine sun disappears from one day to the other. 
wenn wir also die Sonne pff, einfach weg, dann würde jetzt so if sun just Raum went away, Rome space is warped because of the gravitation, and this warp then travels um, like a wave. Um, it, it would sort of make uh, the space become larger and smaller um, around us. You, you could see that, you can measure that by looking at the, uh, at the um, polarization of the background radiation. They tried it, they didn't succeed, they, forgot, they didn't put the correction factor in that is needed um, for the dust that is in the universe. Planck-Experiment vom Planck-Satelliten abfotografiert, weil das They noch took that down from a PowerPoint presentation about the Planck satellite um, instead of copying directly and it didn't quite take the exact value and so there's an 8% chance that they are actually wrong. In one of the most important experiments of our time that's just not precise enough. And we can't just say 8%, oh, no, that's nothing. Um, because it would prove inflation, but it hasn't. 8%, that is too much. So uh, we continue to research this. You can look forward to if we can prove the cosmic inflation with such an experiment, then that also means that the Big Bang has happened um, or has been caused by a uh, quantum fluctuation. So it's it's still it still makes sense to you know become quantum physicist or cosmologist um, because there's still the question what's outside either or what's inside the Planck length. There's so many different um, stories and themes that we can't even touch because uh, it would take too long. But if this experiment would would succeed. That would mean A, the universe came about from a quantum fluctuation. B, it is very probable that there are, that there's more than one universe, there's many universe, universes with many different types of physics. Um, I mean, what could be more bizarre than the fact that it's just us that is here? There could be two possibilities. Either, you know, there's a uh, God-like entity somewhere, you know, uh, the Joe God, um, or, or just by pure randomness. Maybe, maybe all of the time, permanently new universes are spawned. Yeah, so there were so many universes and only in only in the one in which we are, we are here. Otherwise we wouldn't be seeing it if you were if it in a universe where we are not there. So now we could we could talk about the Higgs boson now, we can't do that within one hour, but if we if you like we could we could talk about this uh, again tomorrow perhaps. Uh, see if you can find me and, and then we can talk about can talk about it some more, but uh, it's, but this really isn't just hypothetical. It is very, very close. As far as we know, the universe somehow, nobody knows why. There are new theories, superstrings and supersymmetry and n theory, and it's it's really fun to read and, and to look it up. It's really complicated. The universe somehow was very, 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 very small, smaller than anything you can imagine. All energy, all matter, everything was in there. And then it it uh, expanded very fast. And we still forgot about dark energy and dark matter. And because we can we can measure that, it's it's, it's not just, oh, we don't know, let's just call it dark, but, but it's really there. And spiral galaxy are turning much faster than they should. If all the matter that we can see was all the matter that there is, and you can measure very exactly that there must be more matter there that we cannot see. And we can measure very precisely that galaxies 
far away move move away from us much faster than they should when the universe would was expanding constantly or even or even decelerating but in fact it is accelerating so there must be some other energy driving the universe apart and nobody n really knows what it is but dark matter and dark energy so dark means we don't know but we just see it's there we can see its effects this dark matter and this dark energy make about 95 or 98 percent of the total energy of the universe so what we see all the energy of the stars the planets all of us uh, only make really really nothing we're totally irrelevant in this energy structure of the entire universe but we can see that it is there and and just uh, all of these energies, if we add all of these energies and the universe, that the universe is totally flat, so that, it, that there is no curvature in the universe outside or inside, but it is totally flat. And if we add up all these energies, the positive and those uh, expanding, driving the universe apart and collapsing the universe and all, and, and the sum total of that is completely zero, is exactly zero. And there is no, there's an indication here uh, that the universe, as we see it here, with all the physical properties, uh, could really have come from nothing. Because, as far as we know, there is the uncertainty principle of Heisenberg. Heisenberg, and so there is, there was the possibility that all of this, all this reality, one of this possible reality was there in which it could happen. And so, at this point in time there was no time so there was no time limit for testing it so back looking backwards you could say it was this entire universe uh, came from a gigantic in superposition because it could just just out of nothing from absolute nothing and there is no cause for that and so i want to get to the end and allow some questions. I know it was a lot in a short time. I, I asked for three hours, but well. Super. Yeah, super. You talked so fast. I brought you some water. So, Are there any questions? Please move up to the microphones. Oh, yeah. Fangen wir mal da drüben an. Auf der. Das ist jetzt mein unsere rechte Seite eins, bitte. Yeah, hi. Erstmal danke für den Vortrag. I thank you much for the talk. Du hattest von den Quantenfluktuationen gesprochen. You spoke about quantum fluctuations. And it seemed a bit random like any old quantum fluctuations could happen or anything could be would be probable. So I'd be interested in how far is it the actual measurement of the quantum fluctuation which you may have happened whether the measurement determines the quantum fluctuations. Well, the problem is with with measuring the quantum fluctuation, it's not easy to measure. There's an effect known, predicted by a certain Casimir, which is, that's why it's known as the Casimir effect, where we assume that if you put two very plain, plain metallic planes next to each other and bring them close to each other, then there will be a the quantum physics says that uh, particles can only be created in a space as, as yeah, only whole particles can be created. So between the particle plates, could only only such particles can be generated that are completely or duplicate or three times or fit multiple times, but not ones that fit half or two thirds of the time. Which means that between these plates, only d between these plates, different particles than outside can be generated. Which is why, therefore, the two plates should be pressured towards each other, because there, sh there should be an interference between the outside and the inside. And you can measure this force. I'm not 100% sure if nowadays it's accepted generally that this force 
really um, has to do with the postulated uh, quantum fluctuations, the Casimir fluctuations. But what you can do is you can predict them mathematically. And mathematically, it is possible to predict, as far as I know, like I'm not a quantum physicist or cosmologist, but as far as I know, um, arbitrary particles could be generated or destroyed. This is also a, a cause of one of these Hawkins radiation. So if one 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 of these particles is generated at the limit of the event horizon and is go and one and bit goes into the event horizon into the black hole and the other bit gets outside, which leads to the fact that that there's a particle inside the black hole and that the particle is outside. So which leads to the fact that all black holes will will need to will disappear eventually if they don't get new food. Well, to answer your question, so long as you don't look, will these jet particles will be are both in the state of having been created and not having been created, which you call it something like the zero point energy, which 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 all these physicists try to use very um, you know very faithfully try to use, which. They they keep using, but it doesn't really work with some foils or aluminium. No, it doesn't really work. Well, I think these this fluctuation can take any possible state that is possible, so long as you're not observing. Yeah. My question is, I've heard once that you can either determine the position or you can determine the speed and that the other one is uh, unsharp. So in theory, you could, you could tell the police that um, you wouldn't know I've, I've been here because if well. you measure my speed so quickly, then... How do you know I'm there? Well, in principle, that is correct. If you were a photon, that would be exactly correct. But due to the, that's why this is an unresolved question. Is, are these quantum effects f apply to everything? So the bigger you are, the more energy will be needed to measure it at some point. <laughs> at some point, trying to measure it, you generate more particles, which is also a bit of the problem that the LHC has. The Large Hadron Collider. So you can't separate two quarks because this costs so much energy. So the more you separate them, the larger the energy the holding them together becomes. At some point, you have to employ so much energy to, ge to separate them that you generate a new qu quant uh, quark. So immediately you, they're together again. So you can't separate them, which is that's kind of the same thing with that thought you had. With a macroscopic object, ha also has this object, but it's, it's so tiny that. It's not measurable. Oh, that's a pity. Yeah, well. And then a frage from the internet, bitte. This is a question from the internet. Yes, the net had a lot of fun. So, the tail end of this other question. What do so, st state. Um, it supervises us all. <laughs> so we now have to turn into quants so well, the state can observe well, us. Uh, well, that's, well, I mean, that's nonsense. In some sense, we're only here because they're observing us. Uh, can we have a real question? Well, that's Completely legitimate. Oh, on holographic universe and simulation thereof, how can we tell whether we're in a simulation or not? That's a tough question. You could talk about this for another hour. There is quantum information. There are quantum information theorists who believe that they can prove that this is the case. They say, which is what uh, Dalai Lama also has a has struggling with this random. Well, if it indeed can be proven that the random 
Yes, but they have to change the, the doctrine. Well, the quantum information theory is a they're a very open-handed religion in question marks in quotation marks. Um, um, the idea that to change to change his doctrine based on research is pretty open, I think. By the way, well, there is a part of quantum information theory which says, actually, you know, it's different. Well, you yourself are also quantum mechanical state, so the quantum that arrive are somehow interfere with the ones in one the electrons in our eye which once again is an infinite chain of interference up into our brain and in reality nothing is is being decided so the whole so-called collapse the sort of decoherence it does never actually happens both happens actually so why does someone decide to see one does someone decide to see one thing but not the other thing which means the quint quintessential part of, the, of this piece of confirmation theory is everything is an illusion. But what is the illusion? It as a vast, who is the public? Who who is who is watching this? Who is the spectator of this virtual reality? It cannot be answered right now. This whole question. There are theories as to how to answer it. They exist, but I think they're all nonsense. George says that an experiment has been made and the result is we're not living in a simulation. Very clear. <laughs> this is about hologram. Well, the holographic universe is um, he's talking about is a different thing. It's one thing is simulation. The other thing is the holographic museum. It's quite, uh, universe is quite slightly different. It's slightly confused. It got slightly confused. There is a, um, well, a thing I, I, I don't quite understand, so I don't quite dare talk about it, but people do claim to prove that we are not living in a holographic universe. Thank you very much for the talk. It, as you said, it's uh, some some of these things are hard to understand and they don't seem logic at all, like the quantum mechanics. The problem I have with the standard model of physics in general it is it gets difficult when you look in general. If you look at redshift as a Doppler effect, the the redshift is a linear effect, um, linear in the rate of variation. But you can show that it's actually not a, a linear effect at all, but there's a periodicity of 34 kilom kilometers. And um, you can show that the uh, Feinstoff constante has been coded in there. There's, there's other things, like global clusters. I'll, I'll show you afterwards. I'll show you the proof and the paper, people who uh, published this. You have to look in the details, and the details don't fit. They don't match. I can, I can, there's theoretical things that, you've, that have been measured. Um, they've been referenced, the, the paper has can been I, can, I, can I check? Have you derived the Schrodinger equation? Well, so I haven't actually well, personally. Well, if personally people, if you don't understand what people uh, understand without, I, I think it's a shame that a lot of people spend a lot of time to talk about things, theories that are so random without wasting, without spending time to look at what has, to look at and understand what has currently been done. Yes. It's not that physics suddenly new. Well, people always say fundamental physics has proven that everything could be different. It's not quite the same. Also, the relativity, the relativity doesn't, also doesn't do that. There are always just more refinements of the existing problems. And they also they solve s problems with the existing. Thing. Just the, the thing I want to say, the redshift is not a Doppler effect. Doppler effect. It, but it's, it's the galaxies. Thank you. Thank you. 
you can discuss this afterwards in the Congress um, for hours starting tomorrow. What do you think about the theory of supersymmetry? Well, supersymmetry is a very interesting topic. I don't quite get along with the string theory. It's very random, my thought. I, I do have to see, see his attraction. There are some pretty cool, there's, a, there's some weird mathematical hacks which I don't quite like, amongst other things. Just, just to just mention a few random ones. String theory works because in a certain type of mathematics, the sum of all natural numbers between one and uh, from one to infinity is minus a twelfth. You can derive it. It's a, just a bit fishy, as far as I think. It ex it explains a few things very well, but to this date, there is no not a single piece of evidence. If it, it would work more elegantly mathematically, if every particle had a um, had a symmetrical particle. So, so for every fermion, a gluon, a fermion, and for every gluon, a gluon. So, if there was a mirror symmetry between that, that everything would work a lot better. I have to stop here. We're running out of time, and of course, we could talk about this for hours. Please meet tomorrow and give a round of applause for Steiny. Thank you very much.